Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so I'd like to thank you all for attending our fourth Melasto seminar. And today I'm glad to present uh, Dr. Vinicius Brito, or Vini, or Duartina. <laughs> so Vinicius did his undergraduate, master's, and PhD at the University of Campinas. We've appeared abroad at the University of Dusseldorf in Germany during, during his PhD. Am I right, Vini? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and he's currently professor at Federal University of Uberlândia. And he also spent a period as a visitor professor at the University of Stirling in Scotland. So Vinicius works mostly with flower function and evolution, usually, usually using melastomes as model system. So uh, Vini, you cannot wait to see our presentation. Just remembering that we'll have time afterwards for questions. So I think that we will be able to open your, your microphone if you want, or you could write your question in the chat and we will read it at the end, okay? So Vini, stage is yours. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Lucas, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'll share my screen here. And yeah, I'm really glad to be with you this morning to talk about melastome flowers and reproduction. So my talk will be split in three sections. In the first one, we will see a little, little thing about bus pollination in melastomes. And then we go through flower functioning, uh, mostly about pollen release dynamics. And in the end, I will talk something about the evolution of different reproductive strategies in this family. So as you know, uh, melastomes, they have a huge uh, flower diversity. So we can find flowers of different size, different shapes, and different colors. And as expected, these flowers, they can be pollinated by different animals. So there are some melastomes that are pollin is pollinated by hummingbirds. Some are pollinated by bats, uh, rodents. Some are pollinated by birds. And you can see this in some studies from Agnes. And some ones are even pollinated by small insects like beetles and flies. But all the melastome flowers, or almost all melastome flowers, are, have a, very, a common floral trait, which is the, uh, the porcidal anthers. So all the flowers from melastomes, they have this, uh, the same trait. And this trait evolved very, very early in the evolutionary history of the family. And this uh, makes melastomes uh, uh, connected to a very uh, special case of, of pollination system, uh, a very special pollination system that is bus pollination. So uh, there is an estimation that an estimation of 98% of melastome being pollinated by bees. And if this is true, uh, melastome, melastomatasia could be the largest radiation of bus pollinated flowers. So what is bus pollination? Uh, bus pollination is a very specific way that a bee approach uh, the flowers during the visit. So the bees, uh, they grasp the anthers and the style and curves their body um, in these structures, flower structures, and it started to vibrate their wing muscles uh, in a high frequency and also in high amplitudes. And in doing this, these bees can, um, the, this vibration, are, is transmitted to the anthers, and the pollen grains uh, can be released from these concealed anthers. So I'm gonna show you a short video here in slow motion. So 
you can see the bee uh, vibrating the flower and maybe you, can, you could see some pollen grains, uh, the pollen cloud coming, coming out. Yeah, and this, this, uh, this interaction is very specific, you know? And uh, this, this is very special for melastomes because all the flowers has these underpars and to approach this, how, how important is the, the system is for melastome. I, I have done some studies using this species, Pleroma radiano, and their vibrating bees. Uh, this species is very, com is very common here in the east coast of, the, of Brazil, in the Atlantic rainforest. And we can find uh, these plants on the in, in sites near the coast and also in the top of mountain here. And we compared uh, the visit visitation frequency of bees on these plants in both sites and we found that the higher site is very pollinator limited. So it's spending the same uh, time of observation with the same amount of flowers. We saw just five, only five visits in the higher place and almost 1,000 visits um, in the lower site. And these, uh, as expected, has some implications for uh, pollen release and also for pollen the position on the stigma. So here you can see uh, the number of pollen grains that remain in, within the enter along the flower lifespan. So we can see that in the lower side, there is a decrease in the pollen um, inside the enters, while in the higher side, uh, the pollen in the enters are almost the same along the flower lifespan. And on the contrary, the pollen deposition on the stigma in the low place, lower sites, increases along the flower lifespan, but this uh, did not occur in the flowers of the higher site. And these uh, differences in pollen dynamics here uh, also change the fruit set. So the fruit set in the higher place is pretty much lower than the fruit set in the, um, in the lower place. And, and we also ask it if the, the fruits produced and the seedlings produced by this population, they differ in, the, in their genetic equality. And here we can see uh, the genetic variation within a fruit. And you can see that there's no difference in the quality of these seeds produced. Uh, so the relatedness between progeny and mother and also the relatedness among siblings is the same in both uh, sites. However, uh, comparing the uh, population genetics of the adult trees, we can see that the lower sites has um, higher uh, diverse genetic diversity in different metrics. So uh, using the total number of alleles or the number of unshared alleles between pairs of individuals, we got always um, higher uh, values of genetic diversity in, in the populations where there are more bees visiting the flowers. So with this, uh, we can say that buzzing bees are very important in melastome reproduction. For these melastomes that depend on buzzing bees, uh, we saw that in high elevation environments with less bees, uh, plants produce less fruits and also that these fruits um, generate that, that these populations has lower genet, gen, genetic diversity 
in higher elevations. So this uh, should put a higher pressure in, in, the mel in melastomes and this should also affect flower functioning. And now I'm going to talk to you about two, a couple of studies uh, concerning pollen release dynamics in these plants. So uh, one of the most uh, common uh, feature of bus pollinated flowers is, uh, the, is the presence of two sets of different stemmings. Uh, so these flowers, um, it's common in bus pollinated flowers, uh, two kinds of stemmings, uh, long stemmings and short stemmings. And they are supposed to have different functions uh, within the same flower. So the long stamings, uh, they are called the pollination stamings because they deposit pollen grains on safe sites in the bee, on the bee bodies. And they are expected to have a higher pollination success. On the other hand, the feeding stamings, which is the, the smaller stamings, they deposit the pollen grains on easy groomed sites where the bee can easily collect these pollen grains and take these pollen grains to the, their larvae. And these pollen grains, they are expected to have a lower pollination success. And uh, the own Charles Darwin called this hypothesis as the division of labor because different stemming sets has different uh, roles in, in the same flower. However, it was uh, Fritz Miller, a German naturalist living in Brazil, the first one to describe this, um, this system. And uh, surprisingly, he was looking at a melastome when he described it uh, for the first time, the division of labor among stemming. So it was not a, a Brazilian melastome, but still a melastome. <laughs> uh, at the time, the, the genome was area, but I think uh, nowadays it is uh, heterocentrum uh, flowers. So um, and now I'm going to show you, um, try to better show you what is a, a stemming dimorphism. So here you can see a melastome flower, very common here uh, nearby my, my house. And here are the different stemmings. This is the short stemming, and this is the longer, the long stemming. And we can see differences in anther color. So the anther of short stemming is more uh, conspicuous than the anther of long stemming. We can also see uh, differences in stemming connectives. So we have a longer connective here. And also we can see a different color here in this uh, elongation of this connective, which is pretty similar the the color of the anther. So this is this is a typical um, stemming dimorphism in, that we can find in melastome. And we can also find uh, find stemming dimorphism in other families as well. So it is it has evolved like in 20 times in angiosperms. And uh, this trait is evolutionarily uh, correlated to, to porocidal anthers and also uh, to enantiosteli, which is another uh, flower system, and also to the lack of nectar. So in, generally, in general, um, porocidal anthers, flowers, they have uh, stomach dimorphism and also they do not produce nectar. And this is very common in melastomatasia as well. So as, as we can see, uh, many flower traits correlated with stomach dimorphism, we can uh, predict that the same selection pressures that favor this uh, common trait in bus pollinated flowers also favor all other flower function, functions. And I'm going to show you a couple of, stu a couple of studies 
concerning uh, polling release dynamics. In the first one, uh, um, I, I have studied these two uh, plants also in the Atlantic rainforest here in Brazil. Uh, they are very large flowers and very beautiful, and they are also visited by large vibrating bees, bus, bus, pollination, bus pollination bees. And they have uh, different degrees of stomach dimorphism. So we can see in the purple flower, uh, the anthers, they are, they are different, but not so much. And in the white flower, they are more different. And we use a very simple technique uh, to, to study the pollen release dynamics. We just use an uh, electric tooth, toothbrush. And when you touch the stemmings with this device, we can see the pollen cloud coming out from the enters. And we designed two experiments in this study. In the first one, we, we vibrated flowers, new flowers in each time interval along the flower lifespan. So we call it, it the available treatment because it measures how many pollen grains are available in previ previously unvisited flowers. And the other treatment, uh, we vibrated four flowers per plant in the first time and collect just one flowers. And then in the next time, we vibrated again the same flowers and collected just one and again and again. So here we are looking to the removal effects of the vibration and it measures how many pollen grains are available in previously visited flowers along the flower lifespan. Okay, here are the results. Uh, we can see that no matter the species and also the treatment, we can see some patterns, some common patterns. First, that the pollen release increases along the flower lifespan, uh, which was <laughs> Surpri sur sur uh, surprising for me because I was not expecting this. So uh, these flowers, they tend to release more pollen grains um, late in their lifespan. And we also saw that the long stemming, they release more pollen uh, grains than short stemming, the faint stemming. So um, uh, we expect this result because as the division of labor hypothesis proposes, long stamings, uh, they have, the flower should maximize pollen for reproduction in, in, and minimize pollen for feeding uh, to, to feed the bees. And this result suggests that the flowers has some pollen dose mechanism. So that the flowers has some way to control, to control the pollen release. So uh, to address this uh, question, this problem, we did another study concerning another flower, uh, this tiny and purple flower, also from the Atlantic rainforest. And, and these flowers are also visited by uh, large and vibrating bees. And uh, this study was led by Tuani Boshorn, uh, who is here, I hope. <laughs> And so this is the flowers. This is an amazing flower because you can see uh, all the anthers, all their stamings, they have a very long connective. So this connective can be uh, uh, longer than the own anthers in these flowers. And we try to understand the role of these connectives in the, the reproduction of these flowers. And to do that, we did a simple, a simple uh, experiment, taking off the connectives and measure uh, different components of the vibration of visiting bees, and also uh, the pollen release and pollen deposition uh, in, this, in these two treatments. 
So here the results uh, for the buzzing behavior of the bees. And as you can see, uh, the main components of the vibration are not different between treatments. So no matter if the flower has or has not these this long connectives, uh, the bees vibrates on the same frequency they vibrate they vibrate during the same time and also they perform the same number of buzzes in one visit. So it seems that these um, connectives, they do not change the buzzing behavior of the bees. However, uh, when looking to the pollen release in these flowers, we can see here in this plot that after uh, one visit, there were less pollen grains remaining in flowers with the connective appendages. So it tells us that this connective is um, favoring pollen release in these flowers. And on the other hand, we cannot see uh, any differences uh, among among the treatments when looking to pollen deposition on stigmas. So with these two studies, I hope I have showed to you that buzz pollinate melastomes may present specific pollen release dynamics because not all pollen grains are available at once in these flowers. And uh, at least in this example, long stemmings release more pollen grains per time unit than short stemming. And uh, I hope I also have shown that uh, besides bee behavior, some flower structures as the connective appendage in Oberia uh, may favor uh, or may affect pollen dosage in these flowers. Okay, let's move to the last topic uh, concerning evolution of some reproductive strategies in Melastomatasia. And here we gonna, uh, I'm gonna show you and uh, how uh, the, the pollinator dependence in these um, bee pollinated plants can affect the reproductive success and the reproductive trait evolution in the family. And I'm gonna show you two studies, one concerning flowering, flowering phenology and the other concerning stemming dimorphism. And melastomatase is a very interesting system to understand the evolution of uh, floral traits uh, related to pollinator dependence, because in this system, um, there are some uh, plants that do not depend on pollination for uh, seed set. So here are some uh, species that th they are apomitic, and so they produce seeds without any pollen transfer. And there are some species that are sexual, so they need the pollinators to, to reproduce. And also these apomitic species they uh, also has a pretty low pollen via viability as compared to the sexual species. And this is more or less structured in the evolutionary history of the family because uh, apomixis is more represented in, in, Mikon, in the Mikoni tribe, at least as far as we know. On the other hand, the tribe Microlisi and Melastomaci, they have, they present more uh, sexual uh, species. So uh, we measure this trait, if the plant depends or not on pollinator, uh, on pollinators to set seeds in different places here in Brazil in the Atlantic rainforest and also in Campus Rupestris, which is, very, is a very specific uh, uh, vegetation here. 
So in, in that places, we bagged flowers to see if they are able to produce fruits and seeds uh, without pollinator uh, visits. And we found that uh, we found many species that do not depend on pollinators uh, in the Miconi tribe and many species that depend on pollinator in Melastomach and Microlis tribe. And we also map these traits on the, on the phylogeny of these plants. And you can see here uh, the differences, this um, clade here concerning Melastomachi and Microlisi, the prevalence of uh, pollinator dependence to set seeds. And here in Miconi, the prevalence of pollinator independence to to set seeds and also other reproductive traits like fruit type and the flowering, uh, flowering phenology. Um, okay, and here, uh, here is the main result. Uh, we can see that the species that depend on pollinator to produce seeds, they are no matter if they occur in the Atlantic rainforest, which is a very humid place, or in the Campo Rupes, which has a more seasonal uh, climate, they are seasonal. So there are many plants flowering, melastom, uh, depend, pollinator dependent plants flowering between May and April in the Atlantic rainforest and also between April and May in the Campus Rupestris, which is synchronized with the humid season and also with the season where, in which the bees are more available. On the other hand, uh, plants that do not depend on pollinators to, to produce seeds, they are not seasonal in the Atlantic rainforest. So you can go to the Atlantic rainforest we, you will always uh, found at least one Miconia flowering there <laughs> because they are not seasonal. They can flower in, at any time along the year. However, in the Campus Rupestris, there are some seasonality and we discussed this, that this can majorly uh, be related to water availability because these plants always also produces fle fleshy fruits. So water is very important to fruiting phenology, which in turn could affect the flowering phenology of these plants. Uh, we found a weak relation uh, of flowering phenology to the phylogeny, so to the evolutionary history of these plants, which indicates that the um, that these traits are not, is not um, constrained by the evolutionary history. So, uh, with this example, I hope to show to have shown you that pollinator dependence affects flowering phenology, um, and that the plants that depend on pollinator could be more constrained to flower during the rainy season when the bees are, could be more available. So this plants present more seasonality. On the other hand, the pollinate, plants that do not depend on pollinator, uh, they could flower in a more continuous way at any time of the year, especially in, in places where they, there's not so much um, climate season, seasonality. Uh, we also saw that a low association between phenology and the phylogeny of these plants. And this uh, can tell us that flowering responses to different reproductive strategies has evolved multiple times in, in Melastomatase family. So let's move to the last topic, the evolution of stemming dimorphism. Uh, you already know what is stemming dimorphism, but I put this amazing picture here, uh, here 
to show how dramatic it can be a, a bus pollination in, in a melastomate. So you can see the pollen clouds, the pollen cloud, the pollen hitting the uh, bee's head and the bee's back, just to remember you. And in this study, we, this study was led by Lillian, uh, which was uh, my former uh, master student here in, in Uberlandia. And she uh, developed this stemming dimorphism index, which measures how much these two sets of stemming are different. So if you have zero in this index, uh, it means that the, the, enters, the, the stemmings are isomorphic, so they have the same length. And as we approach the value, the value, the one value here, the, um, the stemming sets becomes more and more different. And we measured uh, this uh, index in many flowers uh, using information from descriptions. And, and then we mapped this trait, we categorized just to better show the, the evolution of this trait. We categorized this stemming dimorphism among stemming, the dimorphism among stemming as isomorphic, as sub-isomorphic or as dimorphic and map it on the evolutionary history of the plants. And we saw that stemming dimorphism has um, changed, the value of stemming dimorphism has changed at more than 160 times in, at least in these plants. And we also saw that there is no big jumps between, uh, between trait values. So we never saw any transition from isomorphic to dimorphic or from dimorphic to isomorphic in, in this analysis. Uh, we also used uh, different evolutionary models to study how um, stemming dimorphism has evolved and if it is related to the pollination, the, um, the reproduction strategy of these plants. So there are two main families of evolutionary models. I, I will quickly explain this to you because I think it could be interesting. So this, there are these two uh, main families of evolutionary models. One is the brown emotion, which is a kind of random, random evolution uh, of the trait along the time. And there's also these OU models that has uh, three parameters. One is the mean trait value. The other parameter here, sigma two, is the variation around the mean. And the third parameter is the how fast one, one trait one trait value can jump to another trait value. And we use these two model families to simulate different, uh, the evolution of stemming dimorphism uh, in plants that depends and plants that do not depend on pollinators to, to reproduce in many simulated trees. And then we make uh, a model, we use a model select, selection approach to decide which is the better model. And the better, the, the best model to us is the one that, uh, that allows distinct mean values of stomach dimorphism and also different variation of this value around the mean for plants that depend and do not depend on evolution, uh, on, on, on the pollinators to, to reproduce. This means that during the evolution, the, the, the evolution of stomach dimorphism, plants that depend on pollinators to, to set the seeds 
they have they have almost the double the value of stemming dimorphism uh, compared to the plants that do not depend on pollinators. And also these values, they vary more around this mean uh, in plants that depend on pollinator to reproduce. So I hope I have shown you that in Melastomatacea, stomach dimorphism has evolved many times, which shows us that this is a very labile trait and also this is a, a kind of convergent trait. So uh, no matter the, the clay that we are looking for, stomach dimorphism um, could have evolved there. And also that the, sele the selective pressure by bees af can affect flower morphology. So uh, we saw that reproductive dependence on bees of multiple size may have affected the stomach dimorphism value uh, in this family. So as the main uh, take home messages in this talk, I would say to you that many melastomes are especially uh, pollinated by vibrating bees and that this uh, interaction um, in, is uh, very common in, in the family and that these flowers may dose the pollen release along the flower uh, lifespan. So the pollen grains inside these four side hunters, they are not available all at all once for the bees. And I, I hope I also have shown to you that pollinator dependence may favor the evolution of specific flower uh, reproductive strategies in the family as flowering phenology, seasonal flowering phenology, and stomach dimorphism. So uh, before I finish, I, I would like to thank you all for coming to this uh, seminar and also to the funding agencies that has uh, funding these, these studies, and also to all my collaborators and co-authors in these studies that I have shown to you, especially for my, for my advisor, Marlisa Zima, and my co-advisor, Klaus Luno, and also to Tuani and Lilia that has led these two, the, this couple of studies that I shown to you about the flower function and evolution in melastomatase. So thank you for the opportunity and I'll be happy to answer some questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you, Vini. Congratulations to you and your collaborators. It's thank an you. amazing talk as always. <laughs> so uh, should, should I skip I the presentation maybe? Yeah, yeah sure. maybe. Yeah, you, you, so. can, you can make it small and then we can see your face when you answer the questions. <laughs> okay, I don't know how to, I will stop if someone has a yeah, question, yeah. I can come back. Uh, I have a, a small question actually uh, Please. about the, the, the index, the stomach dimorphism index. You, you, uh, it's only the size, right? It's, it's yeah. between the size of both. I ask it because there are some species also in Myconi that they have some, they are this, the both stomach are the same size and same color, but they, they differ on small structures such as, I don't know, the, the appendage, the, the connective, but it, it's so small that it, I think it's difficult to, to add in the index, right? Yeah, uh, this is a perfect question because uh, we thought a lot about this issue, but we use the length because this is uh, the simplest measure of uh, stomach dimorphism. And it's also a conservative uh, measure because when you, I mean, if you, we consider the shape or the color of stemmings, it would be much more cases of stemming dimorphism. So we took it as a conservative measure. And also because this is very simple and we can use this index in different families as well. And the I length, understand. 
yeah, and the length of stemmings has also be been used in other student in other studies as a measure of stemming dimorphism. So, yeah, 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 I agree. Yeah. I I like to follow up on that. Lucas actually stole my question, but <laughs> now I have I have another question. So okay. how how easy? I mean, based on my experience, and I worked more on um, uh, old world melastomes. So, so when this time and dimorphism, sometimes it was really. It, it was not so easy to uh, put into defined categories. So, in other words, uh, do you see clear gaps between uh, isomorphic statements and sub-isomorphic statements, and from sub-isomorphic down to uh, dimorphic? I mean, how clear are these <laughs> gaps? At the okay. end of the day, uh, don't you end up with a spectrum? Uh, and uh, so that that. That's yes, 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 perfect. Uh, tr you are totally right. So um, there is a, there is no gaps in, there is a spectrum of stomach dimorphism. We have a lot of values of this index for these plants. So it's a more a continuous trait. And actually we use these uh, continuous values to do the analysis. We uh, choose it to categorize, uh, to better show on the phylogeny, the evolution of these traits. So this is, um, how can I say, an arbitrarily categorization of the, the data. And we consider, let me think about, we consider as dimorphic when the size of the long stemming is the double the size of short stemming. And we consider a sub isomorphic when I don't know the threshold here. So we, we arbitrarily choose a threshold to categorize this stemming dimorphism. But the best way is to look at this as a continuous trait. But you know, the figure, we choose it to categorize because to, to present the but not for the analysis. Can I follow up a little bit on this as well? Um, Please. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, one of the things is that th there are also species, especially in the Mariani, is very common that you alternate uh, a long filament with a short thicky, and then you have a short filament with a long thicky. And <laughs> the end up result is that both set of stamens when they all bend to one side of the flower are um, end up at the same level. All the anther pores end up at okay. the same level. So they, the anthers are dimorphic, but they are of the same length. So that, that's, you know, how can you yeah. deal with that? And, and the other thing um, that I find interesting is that in 90% of the things or 95% of the things that are dimorphic, is the anti sepalus set that is big. Uh, again, in Mariani, in the genus Monochetum, um, in some uh, other, and then in a few isolated cases, you have the complete opposite. That, that is that the anti petals is, is the long one. And, and I wonder if, if, you know, that obviously points to different instances of, of evolution of dimorphism. And if, if you yeah. looked into that. And then last, last question, then you can answer all of them or not. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like looking at your figure, there seems that there are some reversals. And uh, yeah. what do you th think is the evolutionary pressure for these reversals? Okay. So let me remember the first one, Fabian. Long and short, finding the same size, ended up in the yeah, same. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we measured the, this dimorphism on the flower so we have no information about the the couple system bee flower to make sure but you're totally right the the best way would be to to look the the stemming positioning during the visit to really tell uh if these stemmings are really performing different roles uh during the reproduction but it's 
it would be impossible to to collect this kind of data. But you you are you are also right about the um, the different um, how can I say the different ways that the stemmings can be dimorphic, because in the literature uh, since from Fritz Miller, it has been called heterantery uh, this trait. However, in in melastomes, uh, you can have flowers with the same anther size but different filament size. So the flower is no has no heterantery at all. But the stemming dimorphism is there and division of labor is also there perhaps. So this is, this is nice to, to tell, to talk about because uh, it's really confusing in the literature, uh, the, the, the meaning of the term heterentery and stemming dimorphism. And so, okay, the second question was about the reversal. So uh, yes, it's true some, some plants, uh, some flowers has uh, uh, reversed the, the evolution. Uh, and I mean, I, I think it can be related to the um, uh, environmental variation and B in B availability, for example, something like this. And also there's also these um, cases of pollinator shift that Agnes has studied or also generalization. And this, I think this change in the pollination systems can, uh, I guess, can also change or reverse the um, stemming dimorphism. And the last one uh, about the change in the antepetalus or antecepalus, the majority of the melastomes the longer stemmings are antisepalous, but in some plants it has reversed. And this is really nice because it tells us that the, the selective pressure for a uh, stomach dimorphism should be so, so strong and it can evolve even changing the, um, the, the, the role of the stemmings. And there is a clade, uh, Hikantera clade, that one uh, an entire, entire, entire row of stemmings has reduced it, but still there is a stemming dimorphism. So it's, it just show us how strong is this pressure in this, in this family. I, I would like to, to follow up here. Um, great, great talk, Mini. Um, Thank I you. Was, um, I mean, just just surprised thinking of the rarity of heteranthery across angiosperms in general. I mean, it has really gone crazy in melastomes. Like many things have gone crazy in melastomes. Mm -hmm. But like, first first question would be whether you have a hypothesis of why it is has evolved so often. I mean, maybe you already said that apparently uh, flowers are pretty evolutionarily pretty flexible. But then there are many clades where it is not very common, like in, in Mariani, for example, heteranther is actually not so common. Um, yeah, that's, that's the first question. And the second question is, re is related um, to the pollen release dynamics that you presented with the toothbrush, where you found yeah. differences in pollen um, release between the long and the short and this. I, I also found this um, looking at heteranthrus mariani, but then when I looked at how much pollen pollinators extract, it was actually the opposite pattern. Oh, and so that's I wanted cool. to hear yeah. whether you actually yeah. uh, whether you have the same data with actual pollinator observations as well, because I think I I did not arrive with the same result when artificially buzzing as when uh, pollinators were visiting. So yeah, two questions yeah. again. Sorry. <laughs> cool. So the first one about the um, uh, can you just, just, just? Uh, why, why hydrantry evolved so, so often in some melastome clades and not in others? Yes, and yes. So, so this is, uh, I mean, to be pollinated by bees is a kind of risky game, you know, because uh, the bees, especially in this, um, in melastomes, where there is, there is only pollen as a reward 
in the majority of the flowers. Um, and the bees, they eat these pollen grains. So the same uh, reproductive resource is the same, how can I say, currents to pay for the service of the bees. So I would guess that the answer is in this way, because uh, stomach dimorphism uh, should evolve in these flowers that depend on bees, or it should change to another pollinator system. I don't know if I, I ask it, if I answer your question. <laughs> yeah, in a way, but then there are still so many bee pollinated melastomes that reward with pollen and don't have heteranthry. So if it is really such a yeah. successful ah, pollen, okay. why, why are they not all heteranthrous? I mean, yes. I, I don't have the answer, but I'm wondering. Cool, cool. <laughs> and, and I think this is related to your second question um, about the release because we are always looking to a morphological trait and forgetting about the functional uh, trait of these enters. So it is possible that other, f other, features, other features of these enters are functioning differently, even if the, the enters or the stemmings have the same size. And also, uh, it is possible that, as you have, as you, as you said, that um, the, the feeding enter produces more pollen grains than the pollination enters. Uh, some studies has uh, shown uh, different patterns, or patterns that are different from what is expected for the division of labor. So there is a paper recent, recently published by Mary, I think she's not here, uh, showing that the, the production of pollen grains in feeding enter is higher than in pollinate, pollination enters. It's really cool because, so this gave us, uh, at least here in our lab, a hint that maybe it's not just one pressure that uh, favor stomach dimorphism in these flowers, but two pressures. One is the pressure made by the bees. So the bees, they have to be, they have to be paid for the service. So, and they have to collect the pollen and the, the flowers have to, 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 to give the pollen to them. So this is one pressure. And the other pressure is uh, the number of ovules. So the number of ovules is could be driving the, the number of pollen grains on the pollinator, pollination uh, stemmings. So uh, keeping this thought in mind, we can um, imagine it, different scenarios of uh, stemming dimorphisms. So if the flower is really small and have uh, a few ovules, these flowers does not need too much pollen grains in the pollination uh, anthers. Uh, but if these flowers uh, are visited by large bees that has to eat uh, many pollen grains, so the feeding anthers could be more pollen grains. So uh, this is, um, I think this is really nice topic and it is totally under, uh, understood it and yeah, it's, it would be really nice to, to, I mean, we could see at flowers in the herbarium and trying to correlate it, the number of pollen grains on the pollination enter with the number of ovules and the number of pollen grains in the feeding enters with the size of the flower, which is a very good hint of the size of the pollinator. Things like that, I think, could shed light on this question. It's really cool. Is there more questions? Well, on we the have chat? some some questions on the chat and some commenters as well. Oh, from Darren, uh, it would be good to specify isodimorphic versus isodimetric. These things are usually conflated. It's more like a commentary. Okay, I uh, even don't know what isodimetric is. If if. It's there if Darren wants to. Metric yeah. is the is the length, and morph oh. is the shape. 
Oh yeah. Ah, okay. Ah, so this is a better term. Yeah, for us. Oh, thank you for this comment, Derry. It's really important. <laughs> Ma Marcelo says he has a question. Come yeah. on, come on, yeah. Marcelo. Uh, hey, Vinny, great talk. I just thank wonder, you, thing, like, uh, about that falling dynamics release, like how much goes in the first, how much in the second. Do you think that could be related to to the size and shape of the entries? Do you think that would explain or? Sure, or for no? sure. Yes. Uh, now we are conducting a study here, uh, trying to explain uh, how the morphological traits of these flowers can control the pollen release. So we'll try to correlate it, um, traits like the curvature of the anchor. Uh, the pore size, of course, stemming length, and the number of, I don't know the, the English name for this, but the corrugas, you know, the corrugate, uh, yeah. you know? Also that I, we think that maybe could also, and there's also some cases in melastomatase of uh, polysporangiate enters. I, you may have heard about this. <laughs> And okay. this could also be a mechanism to 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 make the pollen dosage in this these flowers, but it's not fully understand still understood still there is another question at the chat, but I think that Lillian just have already answered it so oh, uh, yes, Lillian is the best who want to yeah. to answer. <laughs> Uh, does anyone has another question? Klaus. Klaus. <laughs> My question is about uh, which bees are invited by the melastomes and which bees are excluded. So are bus pollinating bees larger than average bees? You should uh, I, always photos of Xylocophas uh, or bombos <laughs> which get bus. So Maybe these small bees, which cannot, uh, which cannot bus, or which uh, cannot transport the pollen long distances, are excluded by this mechanism of bus pollination. Yes, I, I think you're totally right, Klaus. Uh, and this is, I mean, I think we still not have much data to understand the pressures imposed by pollen uh, thieves and pollen robbers in melastomatation. And yeah, it could be that stemming dimorphism is also related or other flower traits also related to the pollen robbing for sure. Yeah, I, I, I think there, 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 there is a, uh, a suggestion by Henner that the the enter part could be like a mechanism to restrict the the collection of pollen for these non vibrating bees. But, but so I have that... another question about the appendages. Could it be that the uh, you had this clipping experiment? Could it be that the appendages are serving for a better mechanical connection between bee and flower or bee and stamen? Yeah, this is really cool because we tested this hypothesis in this study uh, and we vibrated these enters with and without the connective. However, uh, we got um, how can inconclusive results. And this is maybe because we can measure the vibration only in one axis using the, the laser vibrometer and we cannot tell about what is going on in the other special axis of vibration. So this is a ni nice hypothesis and could be, should be better tested to, to answer. Okay, when, when you arise at this point, which is the axis in which the, boo the bee moves uh, strongest? Is it the long? We do you not know. know. No, okay. we do not know. Yeah, this is another thing that would be really cool to to understand uh, uh, which axis the bees are more prone to to vibrate when they approach the 
these flowers. Yeah. yeah. I think Fabian had some comment. Yeah, I was saying that I, I think that part of our bias here is that most of our knowledge of bee behavior is on large flower plants. But there are plenty of species with tiny flowers that are probably also bee pollinated, but we haven't done the equivalent experiments. And sure. uh, so who, who knows what's happening there? And, and you know, even the basic knowledge of whether they are self-compatible or not, we don't even know that. So, so yeah. uh, it, I think we need field data. I, yeah. and we say that all the time. <laughs> I think every <laughs> single one of these talks has finished with, we need field data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally agree. Yeah. But this is amazing. Very good talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so are we done? <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. okay. Okay, great. Okay. So I will thank you guys. all for coming. Thank you. Really happy to see you here. See you in the field. Thank you, Vini. Thank you for the great talk.